Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about are the tables. Now, you're not going to see my screen change for a few minutes because I want to explain what tables are all about. Uh, tables are uh, used throughout the application, which allow you to collect and report some type of standardized information based on a response to a specific field. So to give you an example of a table, the table would be a relationship table. This specific table is in the associate master file, and it's also in your patient file. And so the relationship table has a, a standard to select from like brother, daughter, father, son, spouse, those types of things. Those sit in a table so that when you have to complete a field that's asking for the relationship, you would just select the item from the table versus having to preform text type the information in. Also with these tables, you can have some reporting put together. There are some standard reports already, but you can also have some additional reporting uh, put together uh, based on the responses that you have in those tables. So it, it's easier to do reporting if you're using of uh, responses to the tables than if you had to type in three, four to text. So if you think about relationship as my example, somebody could type in brother. If, if it was just a free form text field, somebody could type in brother. Somebody could type in bro. <laughs> someone, someone could type in uh, father. They could type in dad or daddy. Or, so you want to make sure that the, you're consistent with your responses in those fields. And so those fields use tables. There are a lot of tables in the system um, uh, that you will see when we go through uh, look, and look at some of the tables. Now, when we set up your initial environment, we set up your initial environment. When we set up your initial environment, uh, we give you a, a standard or a baseline set of tables. And so these have typical selections you'd need based on what the healthcare industry would use for home health hospice and private duty. So we give you a standard set of tables. And there are a couple of tables that you would definitely need to update. And those tables are in the associate support tables category, your uh, associate compliance information. So that's a table you want to update so it has your compliance information in the table. Contractor companies, that's also in the associate support tables. The contractor uh, companies, since we don't know um, who you'd be contracting services with, um, we would be able to give you that table. So you put in the company's name for any of your contracted services. Also, they're in the uh, patient's file, there, the patient support tables, there's one for characteristics. And the one for characteristics is, and this is going to be actually be a table I show you today deals with things like languages, religion, military status, who they live with, and so on. So it's just characteristics to the patient. And then the last table that you definitely need to update is your disaster plan type table. So uh, in the system, we did give you a baseline, but the, the, your disaster plan table type table needs to have everything that meets or matches the strictest of federal and state requirements as well as your office policy. So you've got to have that table fit your entire agency's name for federal, state, and office policy. Okay, so that gives you an idea, an idea of, of what uh, the tables are about and the ones that you'll definitely have to change or look at right up front. All the other tables as you start using the system, if you think you need something else added to the, to the uh, drop down list or a screen, then you can add those as you move forward. So the next thing I want to do is show you how to use the help text. Um, because there are so many tables in the system, we could be here a couple of days going through all the tables. So I'm going to show you 
how to access the help text so that um, you can read up on a table if you're unsure how that table functions or, or how to set it up. Now, when you're looking at the top of my screen, these are our main menus with submenus listed below them. The help text um, is set up the same way with the same uh, the main menu options. There are a couple of extra ones, but they don't have anything to do with these main menu options. And you'll see that when I open this up. So to access the help for the system, you would select the help link that's in the blue banner bar. And you're going to select the help that sits here. So there's one for home health training and help, and there's one for hospice. So you would just select one of these links. And so when this opens up, you're going to see those same menu options, home resources, patient accounts receivable, and so on. And the two additional, you're going to see family portal. It's not in embedded in these others, but you do need to know about the family portal. And then the role training has to do with the security roles. And so you'd need to know those separately outside of using the security information. Okay, so tables, the help text for the tables is sitting under the settings menu. So if I select that menu, then I get a list of options. These are the options that do show up in the under the settings menu in Carefission. So I do get a set of options. So the one I want is the node forms table. So I'm going to select that one. I'm sorry, wrong table, excuse me. I actually want uh, the lookup tables. This is the one I want to use. When you're looking in the hospice, that whole screen it could be in a little bit different sequence. So um, I'm working with the lookup tables. Lookup table, you have to get your brief explanation of what it's about. Then we give you a list of the table categories. So there's accounts receivable support tables, associate support tables, clinical support tables, and so on. These are the categories. If you want to know something about the clinical support tables, just set, select this as it is the link on the screen. And so now I'm looking at a list of all of the clinical support tables. These are each individual tables that are under the clinical support uh, category. So you can select this information and I'll just select one that might be a little bit easier to work with. Uh, let's go with the vinyl type real quick. And so it's going to explain to you what the table is. We're going to show you the path you take to get there. And then what we'll show you how to add information to the table. So you get screens and examples. We'll show you how to edit the information that's already in the table. So you'd see that. Also, you will have the ability to provide view only access to the tables. Um, most locations, this is the locations, this is the system, Carpition system administrator um, um, responsibility. So you may not even give people access, but if you do, you can view what the item looks like in the table without making any changes. And then you'll also be able to delete a table. So all, all of the instructions for uh, the tables um, are sitting out here and all the tables have add, change, uh, view, and delete. So you'll see that spread throughout the table. So that's that's pretty much how to access and, and look at the help text for any of the tables that are available to you. So I'm going to close back out of this. You can go directly back to the home screen if, if you don't uh, want these open, then you would want to close the individual ones. So I came right back to my home tab, and I'm just going to close this out. Okay, so that gives you an idea how to access the health information. So you can re read up on some of the tables. Some of the tables, when you look at them in the list, are self-explanatory. Others, you might want to know exactly what they do, so that will help you. Okay, so I'm going to start going through some table examples. So I'm going to go to my settings menu. 
and I'm going to go to the lookup tables, and I'm actually going to take you into the associate support table. So this is the category, and the, the tables that are actually under this category are sitting to the left. So I want to go to my associate note type. The majority of your tables will look like this. You'll have a code, a description, a possible group code, a sort sequence, um, and in this case, you'll have an additional column whether you want to uh, create a communication into WorkBasket or not. You can edit the information uh, in the table. This is the view only access, and this allows you to delete it. It won't let you delete it if it's previously been used. So if you want to edit one of these, all you have to do is select this. And let's say I just want to make this a, um, a little more descriptive. I'll put that in. And so that, that allows you to edit the table. So these descriptions are what's going to show up in the field that you'd be working with to select from. Now, I want to add an associate note type, so I want to go through this. Some tables have one digit code like this one, so you can use A to Z and one through nine. So that gives you 35 possibilities into the table. This table, I don't think I've seen more than 12 or 15 in the table at any given time. The code you use, um, in this case, one code, you cannot repeat, so you have to use a new code that's not been used before. Then you've got a section for a description. And I'll just put in a description here. Now, group codes. If you look over at the table itself, if you've got information in the table itself, if it's blank, then you wouldn't be using group codes. There are some tables that do use group codes, and group codes do a couple of things. If you have a really large table, like your care needs, goals, and interventions can be uh, larger tables, you could have them organized so that certain things are grouped together uh, in, in the specific sections when you go to select that information. The other thing group codes do is they, they will take the data that you've entered one place and put it somewhere else if you have that same field somewhere else, so you don't have to re-enter the information. A good example of that is when you're doing a start care assessment service note. You have information that would complete the physician's orders in there. You can have the medication profile in that service note where you're constructing the medication uh, profile for a patient. Um, you have a, a disaster plan information there as well. So what the group code does is if it goes into the orders, it'll take that information and put it in the appropriate field in the orders. If you have it gone into the medications the profile to the medications tab, the most medications you put in will go there. And um, if you're doing a disaster plan information, you put it in the uh, starter care assessment service now, it'll initially flow to that section within the patient encounter. So uh, that's another thing that group codes will do for you. It just takes information from one area of the application where you entered it and put it in another area where you need to use it. Okay, so this one doesn't have group codes. Sort sequence. You can let this default to the sort uh, sequence 99 by leaving it blank. Craig, I'm, Craig, I'm sorry, I have a question about the group codes real quick. Okay. So if 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 you have a, a group code uh one, two, three on on something in a table, then and and that information is gonna flow to another uh, area, then you have to have group code one, two, three on the table in that other area. No, the other area is just an input field and it just posts that group code to that input field in the other area of the application. So if you were entering 
uh, let's say there's a section in the service note where uh, where you're entering um, the uh, disaster plan information. So that group code would take that information that you put in the service note and it points it to the disaster uh, plan section within the page and encounter. So there's no table that it would point to there. It just populates the patient encounter. So it, 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 that's what the group code does. It just takes that information and puts it somewhere else. If you're thinking about, map it. I, I guess, I, guess about, what, I think what we're not understanding is how does it know if you put in that group code, how does it know where to, map. to flow that information over to? Okay, because the, the the group code that you would be using, um, and we and we give you the group codes that you'd be using, the group codes that you'd be using. Let, let's say it's one, two, three, and you uh -huh. and you, you have it in there. It says take one, two, three group code and update the disaster plan section. Got it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, okay. Great. <laughs> okay. Now, sort order. The sort order, um, you can let it default to the system sort order, and the default is always 99. If you want this to show up in a different sort sequence, then you'd want to uh, develop a sort sequence for it. So, for example, this one I wanted to show at the top of my list. I'm going to make it a 10, because I know it's going to be at the top of the list. And so when I'm looking at my information for this, my table, when I go to use it and select something from it, my table is going to show this one first. Once I say this, it's going to show, I'm sorry. Let me, let me change this to five. I already have a 10 sitting out here. So I'm going to, it'll show this one first. It'll show this one second because it's 10. It'll show this one third because it's before the 99s. And then all of these that are 99 are in alphabetical sequence. Where I typically find tables where you want to use a specific sort order or things like, think about your discipline um, categories that you select from. You most likely are selecting skilled nursing all the time. So you'd want that one sitting at the top of the list versus being in the S's in a true alphabetical table. And let's say the next one you want showing is home health aids. And, and let's say you have a discipline for a music therapist or massage therapist. You hardly ever use those. You want them to appear lower in the list. So that's where changing the sort sequence just changes the order it displays in when you're using a, a selection from the table. So that's what that does. So if you want something to go even further down, let me go ahead and add this first. I'll just add it. If you want something to go a little further down, like let's say this general information is probably the last thing you use, then take it below 99. So maybe I want it to be 110. And so now when I'm working with the table, this one's going to show first when I select it. This one's going to show next in the, in the listing. This one will show third. The 99s will be in alphabetical sequence after the third one. And this one's going to show last. So <laughs> I'm going to show you where this table fits so you can see what this actually does. So I'm going to go to my resources menu, my associates file, and I'm going to select an associate out of the list. Now, now, just about every individual module in the system, associate, physicians, facilities, other referral sources, patients, uh, your organization payers, accounts receivable, all have a notes tab. And so the notes tab allows you to organize the notes that you're in, entering based on the type of information. So you're going to see this notes tab all over the place. Each one of those modules has its own notes table because you wouldn't want to have performance notes in a physician file or in uh, the patient file. So each one of those notes sections in each individual module has its own set of tables. 
So when you're working with the tables, I'll select add my note and I'm going to select note type. Here's where the table is being used. So I can organize by notes by, by type of information I'm putting in. So I said this was my personal note, but I just entered my zip code to the number five, so it's at the top of the list. This one was coded 10. This one was coded 98 in the table. These three are coded 99, and this one I've, I've said I hardly ever used, so I moved it down to 110. So that's how you can use the sort sequence. If you want it in true alphabetical sequence, they all need to be the same number, either 99s, 1s, 10s, whatever you want to do. Usually, if you just leave it blank, it defaults to 99 for you. And so you can organize the notes by the type of information you put in. I'll just select one real quick. Whoops. Okay, so now you can have three or four different uh, of scheduling uh, notes that you're putting in, so you'd be able to filter for it. So it just gives you an idea where uh, you would see this table being used. So you'll you'll learn more about the notes when I go through the associate master file training. Okay, so I actually wanted to go back to the associate support tables and this associate note type for just one more thing. There was an option in here when I added this, and I'll just open up one of these because it's got the same field. Uh, do not generate a word basket tab. This is actually a communication. The work basket in the system has a to do list which means there are some action items in order to move it to the next step of the process or complete something. Uh, it shows it in work basket as an action item. Work basket also has a communication section. The communication section pulls information from the notes that you would entered. So if this one for scheduling, the note that I entered on schedule shows, shows up in work basket as as a communication <laughs> excuse me so it shows up in work basket as a as a communication from my perspective i don't think the associate note types should show up in work basket as a communication because i don't think i want performance notes to show there probably not payroll notes um it, it, you know these to and uh, Upload a document doesn't really show you anything. It just says upload a document, so it's kind of meaningless there. So if from my perspective, I would not want anything from an associate uh, master file record because this is kind of your HR section to show in work basket. Doesn't mean you can't control or manage who has access to that information, but just not sure I'd want it out there just in case you accidentally assign it to somebody that shouldn't have it. So the only one I probably would put out there is probably the schedule of notes. So I should have check marks next to all the rest of these for sure. Okay, so that I wanted to show you. The other thing I want to show you about is there are a couple of items in the tables. And you'll see this in a <coughs> Excuse me, in several tables where you cannot edit. So these two you cannot edit and you cannot delete them. Any items that are sitting in the table where you cannot edit, delete, those items we have to have in the table to run something else in the system. So this particular one, we needed to have it in the table to create uh, some kind of reporting. And this one, you have the ability to upload uh, documents into the system and attach them to the associated master file record. And so we need to have this in here because it writes it, uh, it automatically writes it up. So again, you're going to see a couple of these where you can't edit or delete them. And it's because we do need them in the system. Okay, let's move on to a different table. I want to go back to my associate support 
table category. This time I want to go to compliance because this one is a little bit bigger. Okay. I have one that, um, let's see if I've, somebody's updated my table. Okay. So here's what I'm going to show you how to add compliance. You did get a baseline table for this. If you need to remove anything from this table that you would not use, all you have to do is select the edit icon and enter an end date. So for example, a lot of locations don't have a corporate compliance uh, program, so um, it could be in the table. So if you don't have one, just come in here and put in an end date. That's the same as the start date. Uh, to set these up. If you've got something that you put out here and you want to put in an end date because you no longer want to use it, let's say you've used it for six months and you no longer want to use it, then just access the item in the table and put an end date in it. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to add one. So I'm going to select my add. Now I'm going to put in an IV therapy certification. I'm going to make this a two year certification. And of course, this, this is just an example. If you needed an IV therapy certification, that's once every year, once every three years, or once every five years, then you can do what you need to do with the description. So I'm going to put in an IV therapy certification, two year uh, certification. And, and this is for um, your RNs only. Okay. So that's what I'm going to start with. All right, in the compliance tab, which is part of the associate master file, it's divided between two sections, employment requirements and medical requirements. Employment requirements would be like a, a background check, um, 90 day or annual evaluation, um, I-9, those types of things would be classified as employment requirements. Medical requirements would be like hepatitis B, uh, influenza vaccinations, rubella, rubella, those types of things would be medical. So I said this is an IV therapy certification, so I'm going to put it in the employee, uh, employment requirements group. Now, this one applies to, I can have this apply to all associates. That means that they are your administrative people in the office, your caregivers in the field, any contractors, as well as volunteers. So it applies to everybody that's in the file. You can do one that's contractors only. So if you're using independent contractors, you would have to uh, collect some certain requirements uh, from them. Uh, and they have to meet comp the compliance requirements for your agency. For an independent contractor, like they, you may need to see that they have the active malpractice insurance and they may have to have a 50 or a 75 or $100,000 bond or something on file. So you would need to know that. So if you have to do that for the your independent contractors versus group, group contractors, then you can set that up just for contractors. Employees only. This would exclude anybody that's flagged as an independent or group contractor or volunteer. Field only. This would be for any of your uh, associates that you've entered into the file, uh, into the associate master file uh, that are classified as field employees. Uh, office only. This would just pertain to the people in the office. I, you probably will hardly ever use this. The time I've seen this used is when uh, locations have two uh, HIPAA classes. One is for your caregivers that are seeing patients and the other one's for your administrative because your administrative has access to more information like the HR files, for example, or accounts receivable billing and those types of things. So you could have two different HIPAA compliance programs. And then for your volunteers, you may need to see that they've got an active driver's license and when it expires, as, as well as having auto insurance, uh, your volunteers might be taking patients or 
patients to the doctors or maybe to church or um, grocery shopping or something. So you could just set it up just for your volunteers. Now I'm going to select this one for all associates. Now I said this was for an IV therapy certification. So that means that it's got to be for your registered nurse, but I, your registered nurses, um, most locations don't have contracted registered nurses. You could, but they're really your primary discipline, so you shouldn't have. But I'm going to set it up for all associates. Your registered nurses could be administrative, and they may, and they may be overseeing the IV therapy team. So I'm going to flag it for all associates. Then my date time. I have a completed date, background checks, those types of things are a completed date, renewal date. This is a two year certification, so it needs to have a renewal date time. Then a start date. Now, when I first set up these tables, if I was setting up an agency during the transition, I'd probably back uh, some of these up. And you, I mean, you could take them back further. So you just want to make sure that it's, it's going to be available to you when you're entering information uh, into the system. If you let it default today uh, and you need to use it for some somebody uh, that would have had the requirement yesterday, it wouldn't be there. So I'm going to I'm going to just move them back a little bit. End date. This could be an example of putting in an end date at the same time you're doing a start date. So let's say this was the influenza vaccination and your start date was 10-1-2020 and your end date you could put in would be 3-31-2021. Then you'd come in and add another one to the table. The start date would be 10-1-2021 and the end date would be uh, uh, 331 2022. So, this could be an example of when you'd put in an end date. If you don't put the end dates in, you can always come back and edit and make them inactive. Now, sitting over at the right, I'm saying that I have, I have a two year certification for RM. You do have an option at the top to check every, every discipline, and if you check that, every discipline will get this compliance item. As I said, this was two year RNs. I don't want it for everybody. I do want it for RNs. I said I couldn't do it for anybody else. So there's not, nobody else sitting out here uh, that even though there are other uh, professionals, so there's professionals and paraprofessionals sitting out here. Now, I have seen where you might need a nurse practitioner to have this too. So if you have a nurse practitioner on staff that is part of your IV therapy team, then you could list that as well. Once you update this table, just go ahead and hit the save button. Okay, so my IV therapy certification, here it is, and I did a two-year two certification for the RN. So here's um, here's what you uh, what you need to know about this, there's an, there's an additional step to it that you can take so that not every RN will get this. So if you have 20 RNs and, that work for you and only four of them are part of your um, IV therapy team and require the certificate, then you don't need this compliance item for the other 16. So what you can do is you can select a little icon to set them as not needed. So I select that icon. Now, I find when you get this screen pop up, I find if you check them all, so that means that everyone that's in a file would not get this compliance item, and then remove the check marks for the ones that will. So I'm saying these, these two should get it, and these two should get it. So once I do this, then all the other ones will have met this compliance requirement because it's not needed. And I'm going to show you where that sits. So once I do this, these four individuals will have this compliance item on their compliance screen and the others will not. So I'm going to go ahead and select my save. I'm going to go back to my associate resources menu. 
uh, under the resources menu, and I'm going to select one that has the compliance item I said this person would. And so when I look at this, I'm back in the associate master file. I have a tab for compliance, so this is where it's going to go. Now, instead of a drop down, this is going to display on the screen. So on the screen, you'll see all of the compliance items that are required for this individual associate. So uh, the ones that have a green bubble means that they are compliant. The ones that have a red bubble mean they're not. So I just wanted to show you where this is at. You're going to learn how all of this functions when we go through the associate training, but I wanted you to see this for the IV therapy certification. So here's the one I just added. So once you have their certification information, you can mark it as uh, completed. So I want to take you into a different associate. I'll just slide down a little further to take you into a different nurse. So the, here's another nurse that's sitting out here. Here's their compliance tab, that um, IV therapy certification. Here's where it's flagged is not needed. So that's what I did when I was doing the tables. So it's flagged is not needed. And you can see that they've met their compliance uh, requirement. Then anybody that would not have been part of that discipline, uh, like a um, let's see, let's go with this home health aid. You'll see on your compliance tab that it doesn't show up at all. So you are able to completely customize this and point it to a specific individual. So you can do it for everybody. You can point it to disciplines. You can point it to specific individuals uh, so that you're keeping track of all your compliance items in the system. Okay, so I, the next table I want to go to is uh, falls under the patient support tables. I want to talk about the characteristics type. This is a little bit different type of table than the rest of them. There's no code involved, and this one has all group codes. And so when I'm adding this, I'll we'll just go ahead and add one. I, you can add um, information to this table. Uh -huh. Let's just put in there. The guy I can't type today. Okay, and then my group code. I'm putting in a language, so I'm going to put in a language as my group code. Now, this one's source sequence. You can let it default because it's not going to matter whether it's ones or 99s. Uh, the default is typically 99 like you see in this one. But somebody, when they set up this table, just put in all ones for the group code. So these group codes won't, uh, or sort orders won't matter. The group codes is the important piece. Now, you can add uh, individual group codes that may not have been listed in the table to begin with. Like I added these two for military, active duty, and veteran. And so by putting those in the table, I created my own group code in this situation. For the most part, we'll be giving you the group codes that you'll have to use to move the data from one place to another. So this one, you will be creating your own group code. So you can see languages as a group code, lives at as a group code, lives with, and so on. So you'd be creating your own uh, group code. I'm going to backdate this again and hit my add. Okay, so um, this is kind of a fun table. So I'll show you how the group code works. Uh, for this table, this is part of the patient encounter file. Um, let's go with um, usually down a little further. Let's go with this individual. And so that was the characteristics table. Characteristics table sits on this tab. And so you have those sections, those uh, selections from you to, for you to choose from. So you would be adding your characteristics. Now, if you already added, added them, you could update them. 
So here's, here's where I'm using the table. I can say that this person person speaks um, in, uh, in, uh, excuse me, English, Russian, and Japanese. And uh, do they live, where do they live at? I just happen to have one for Sicily facility if you wanted. If you wanted more, you could do another lives out. It could be a nursing home or a group home, or maybe you want to include the patient's home. Who they live with? Here's the military status. If you don't select one, then it doesn't populate, and then you just check something for their religion and hit your say. So those group codes that, and if you make them up like you could for military. Um, those group codes are what populate the label on this screen. They, this is what populates the label on this screen. So I, they were all fell under language. So you see English, Japanese, and Russian lives with it's the group code that populated this, and my option was family. And then I did my religion. So that's where these group codes are used so that they just make up the labels on the screen. Okay, so the next table I want to show you is also in uh, the patient support tables, and this is going to be your disaster plan type table. So this is one of the tables that you need to make sure meets federal state requirements as well as your office policy. It has to be the strictest of all those requirements. So you'll be adding the information to uh, the table. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So you could have 12, 15, 17, 20 different items. I'll give you an example. If you had somebody that was flagged as patient does not need assistance, some locations are having patient does not need assistance uh, for fire. So that could be patient does not need assistance dash fire, patient does not need assistance dash earthquake, patient does not need assistance dash tornado. So you could have that same one group code. So if your policy is saying that you, uh, you'd like to have that information, then that's how you'd update this table. So, where, um, so you want again, you want to make sure that this meets the strictness of all your requirements, your table, you can change any of this information if you need to. So it's simply by editing the information for the table. And then, of course, you'd be adding new items to the table. So um, you just want to make sure that you've got everything covered that you need covered for your agency. All right, so this is the disaster plan type table where you'd be updating the information. I'm going to go back to my patient encounters because I want to show you where this table sits because there's a little more to uh, using the table information. So I'm going to select my patient again. Now the disaster plan information that you record is on the clinical tab. And so when you're looking at this information, you're going to see the disaster plan. So when you're updating this, and this is why I wanted to show this to you, is you get to put in plan details that are specific to this patient. So I selected that the patient does not need assistance, and I put in my reason why I selected this one and what's going to occur. So it says family neighbor will not will be able to assist the patient in case of emergency. Patient can wait a couple of days uh, for care to continue. You may want to know where where they're being sent to. All of that information you can include as the plan detail for your disaster plan. So having all this, uh, your appropriate disaster plan code and your details is part of your disaster plan reporting. So the disaster plan report from the system shows you what code you selected and the detail. Okay, we had some office that uh, they were trying to say, they put patient does not need assistance, family and neighbor. Um, or family to take the patient, they get another code for patient to take the patient and so on as their, their disaster plan type code versus trying to update this information. 
and they got a little carried away and they probably had 200 different disaster plan types. And so um, just keep that in mind that these should be your standard codes uh, that you need to have set up. And then you have the ability to enter any plan details. Okay. So the next one I want to go to is the service code tables. Service code tables fall under the general support tables. General support tables allow you to enter announcements that appear on the home page. Uh, they also let you um, update uh, some specific information for the document status type, diagnosis categories, if you need to have some unique ones. Uh, all of your hospice letters and labels um, are part of the, this general support tables. Uh, anything that, that accesses multiple areas of the application for you to use, like service code skills teams, those things uh, fall under the general support table. So if you saw something and you think uh, it should be in one, one of these other ones and you don't see it in the list, just go to your general support tables. So I want to go to the service code section. The service codes identify services. Uh, this is where your supplies would be housed, your uh, DME, if you're providing DME and billing for it. Uh, all of your uh, pharmaceutical information can be put here. Um, so your screen should have another link uh, to the right of ad attachments that says NDC or the National Drug Code for your pharmaceutical information and so on. So um, this is where everything sits. If you're doing outpatient therapy, all the modalities you use, which are the procedure code, um, are listed here. So if you need to build by procedure code, those, those would be in this table too. Now we did give you a service code table, a baseline service code table. It, it probably has at least 783 items in the table. It might have more. Might have a few left, but you're going to have a lot of them in the table. Now, if you want to uh, filter this information for the tables, you can use one of the filters that's in the column. So this one is uh, my filters are set for all. So these are my filters. So if I just wanted to look at my routine services, so I filter that. So out of that 793, my routine services are 103. So you can see that the modalities and supplies are probably taken up. Uh, the majority of the information in my table. So um, you also, I'm going to put this back in all. I like to use the service code category. So the service code category, so if you're working with a specific discipline, you can select it for that discipline. So now if you look at my table down at the bottom, I have two, 22 service codes that I'm working with for skilled nursing. Versus having to slide through 783 codes to find the one I'm looking for. So, um, this is the filter I use the majority of the time. You do have a status that defaults to all, which shows you both active and inactive. And if you see one that's sitting out here that you'd like to use, it, like for example, this RN post mortem visit is inactive. All you have to do is select the item, and if you want to activate it again, remove it. Most of these that are in your tables uh, to start with that are inactive like this will have the appropriate revenue code and hit pick codes and any modifiers associated with them. So that will be there. Okay. So um, for services, it, you're going to get a public screen to add services. This is probably has the, the most options or variables to it. There's one for adding pay onlys. Pay onlys are your non-patient care time situations like uh, uh, in-service, um, case conference, team meetings, if you're paying for holiday. Holiday mileage reimbursement, uh, IDT review would be a pay only. There, those things that you need to keep track of payroll hours and dollars that you're not going to bill to a patient. So that's what pay onlys are. Your attachments, 
are going to be your supplies. If you're building DME through here, then your DME, um, all your pharmaceuticals are classified as attachments. Now, if you're building pharmaceuticals, uh, hopefully you'll be able to get a spreadsheet from your pharmacy or pharmacies that you use so that you, all the steps are automated. Because if you do have a spreadsheet in the format we need it in, it will upload, you can upload that into uh, CareVision and we will create the service codes for you. We'll bring over the NDC number into the file. Then we'll create the service code for you. Uh, we'll put in the charge rate uh, for that pharmaceutical. We'll update your organization payers that use that pharmaceutical. And we'll, we'll uh, put the uh, pharmacy on the bill for you. So it does all of that just by uploading the document. If you had 100 items on your document to upload, it takes a, a matter of minutes to do that. If your pharmacy doesn't give you a spreadsheet, and hopefully they do, I recommend that whatever information they give you that you create the spreadsheet to upload. Because if you were to do all these steps manually, it could take you 15 to 20 minutes to complete uh, one pharmaceutical that you're adding for a patient just to get it on the input. So the upload process is much faster, much, much faster. Majority of locations, their pharmacies will give them a spreadsheet in the format uh, we need it in. Um, if you have a pharmacy that doesn't, uh, do you have, I have a question. Do you have a copy of the spreadsheet that you can send us? Actually, we do, and it's also under the help, but I'll give it to you because <laughs> there is one that you can, that you can follow. Interested in what fields are needed and then naming conventions. Okay, I'll, I'll get you when I get to the spreadsheet, you'll see what's what's required and what the field names are called. Most of the most of the pharmacies provide us uh, with the spreadsheet in the format they send it in as a .csv. But if they don't send it to you that way, uh, then you can save it as a .csv to upload it. So in that save file format. So all that information is in some documentation, and I'll get to the documentation. Okay. All right. So our accounts receivable support team is going to go through and show you how to add the services and attachments because all of that, uh, for the most part, is going to deal with billing. So they'll show you how to get them set up. Make sure you've got the right codes, um, billing codes and modifiers, and billing codes can be hit pick code. Make sure that all of that stuff's coded correctly for your different payers. So they're going to help you um, go through adding your services. They will also go through and help you with adding attachments for your supply. So that if you are able to give us a, a, a supply spreadsheet, and I do believe we're taking your um, I do believe that we are taking data out in it directly out of your system. Um, I'd have to check to see if we pulled the uh, supplies uh, out of your system for you. If not, if you can create a spreadsheet version, you can send it to us and we can upload your supply listing versus using ours. Sometimes that's faster. We've had some locations that have 500, 600 supplies, and we just removed our little supply spreadsheet and upload it there so it's formatted correctly. Okay, I see something from my link. Since you did pull supplies from our SQL database, and our development people's working on that. I wasn't sure if they were or not. I have a question from Amy. Would this pharmacy and uh, spreadsheet info also populate the hospice patients chart for their med profile? That not the upload piece, it does not do that. So you would have to be building that initially. That's a good idea then. Uh, 
Um, I'll, make, I'll make a note of that. Okay. Uh, there are spreadsheets for the supplies and DME. So, Molly, if we pulled the supplies out of your uh, SQL database, then we would be using your set of supplies. I'll just check into uh, where the development is pulling and see if I can um, what they've got so far. Okay. So what I'm going to show you on this screen is how to add a pay only. So I'm going to select the add pay only. Now, when you're working with pay only, you get to make up the service code. And so I need to look and see what I do have sitting out here real quick. Let me back off of this and I'm going to change this to pay only so I can add one. That's here it is. Okay, so um, I want to add um, a pay only. I'll just kind of make up something. Let me see. Do I have the IDT sitting out here? I do have it. Good. So I'm going to add my pay only for IDT. So I'm going to add, and this service code is up to five just, uh, characters long. So you can have added IDT review. And you could put in a fifth character if you wanted to, but you could leave it at four or three or two. I have another question real quick. So as it is now, the clinician has to populate them in a profile, no way for it to be automated. Now, the, when you're doing your initial assessment, you're looking at the medications that the patient is taking to help build your medication profile. You do have the ability to uh, use a medication kit so you can create a medication kit that will populate the med profile with a group of medications all at one time. So um, we don't have uh, the spreadsheet updating the uh, medications profile because you've built that first before uh, they even send you the information. So you should have a medications profile at the time you're doing the assessment. But I made a note. I made a note of that. I'll I'll, um, uh, I'll share it with our clinical people and and see what they say about it. So right now there is no no way the clinician can populate that from the spreadsheet. Okay, so I'm doing this as an IDT IDT review one. So I can put this in as an IDT review. Now here's what I want to tell you about the long descriptions. The long descriptions you want to be as, as descriptive as possible. So uh, to give you an example of one for a surface, if you have an RN high tech uh, assessment, uh, initial assessment visit, that's what you'd want the description to say. The long descriptions are what you'd be searching through in the tables. And so um, on, when you're putting that information in, I could have the say interdisciplinary team review. I could have typed this out, but you want to make sure that your long descriptions are as meaningful as possible, especially the services so that you, you're picking the right service. Short descriptions. Now for pay only, this doesn't matter. For billing purposes, the short description is what typically goes on a paper claim. It, it could say, if I were using that R and I check assessment visit to pay them in increments was the long description. My short description on the bill could just say R and assessment visit. And so your short description is really based more on what uh, the payment source wants. So in this case, because this isn't going to go on any bill, you can have your long description and short description set. Unit of measure. Well, maybe we ought to make this a little bit different. Let's put in hourly. So some locations pay a flat fee for the IDT review meeting, some pay an hourly. So I'll just go ahead and make this an hourly. So my unit of measure, when you're working with services, supplies, pharmaceuticals, uh, pay all these, all of that. 
uh, you have the same unit of measure table. So 15 minute increments, and then enough for this, you would typically do that for services. This is not a supply, so you wouldn't be using boxes or items. You could flag it as days, but you most likely would not want to, unless you're doing flat T per IDT review and flat at one time. And if you're paying them $75 and whether they're two hours or uh, or the whole day, if they still get $75, so you could flag it at days, but I don't think I would. Then, uh, of course, grams for your uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, you have grams, international units, milligrams, millimeter, and the unit. So those are pretty much your pharmaceutical codes. Uh, for this, I said I wanted to do hourly, so I could do hourly. Um, and if this was a per visit, you could flag it a per visit. If you're setting this up because you want to keep track of payroll hours for uh, your administrative associates, eight hour days and 40 hour weeks, you could select uh, days and just enter an eight hour time frame or a time frame for that day. And then for weeks, you could put in a time frame for the whole week. So uh, you could do that. Service type, you don't have much of a choice. You could add another mileage option, but um, that we have the mileage reimbursement so much per mile in the system. Some locations pay reimbursed mileage by the visit. So they say we give you $5 um, per mileage reimbursement for each visit you do. So if they dro drove two miles, they did, they did well. If they drove 20 miles, they may not have done so well. Then your service category. This one, you don't have much of a choice. So these are pay -outlines. So um, with, then when you're working with the, how you're collecting the time information, this would never be a billable service. So you would never bill anybody for any of these pay only codes because they deal with non-patient care time. So that's blanked out. There could be um, a time where you are doing a non-billable assessment visit for paraprofessional services. There are some um, state Medicaid waivers and managed care payers that want uh, initial assessment visits done by an RN, but you can't bill for them. But the services you are billing for are like companions, chore workers, homemakers, and so on. So you could, but most likely you, don't have, you wouldn't have a lot of those if you did. We're saying we're creating the payroll information we're also saying we want to require time, and you would want to require it because of hourly. The supervisory assessment, this really has to do with uh, services that are provided for those disciplines that require a supervisory visit. So if you had one of the therapy assistants, for example, or, or a, a, a CODA, um, it, it, those services that they provide, that service code should be checked with as a supervisor assessments needed for that service versus and for your home health or hospice aid. So you'd want to make sure that box for that service is checked, not the pay on it. And so I'm going to leave this blank. Then the date you want to start using them. Now, this is one of those you could put in an end in. It might be easier just to come back and end it if you no longer need to use it. Um, typically, when I see an end date put in here, somebody has a contract that runs from July 1 to June 30th, and they put in an end date for the pieces, for the uh, pay only pieces that the contract um, says they're willing to pay for during that, that contract period. So you could put one in. You can do that for services too. I believe in blank. Then there's a section here called earnings code. Earnings code uh, actually lets you organize all the services in the system uh, based on how your payroll uh, accepts the information. So to give you an example, you could have 10 assessment service codes. You could have Assessment, reassessment, high tech assessment, 
uh, assessment without OASIS assessment. With OASIS assessment, his assessments, those that don't require the his and so on. So you could have a variety of different service codes. Your payroll system, all they care about is their assessment visits. So each one of those service codes in our system, you could point to that one assessment visit earnings code in your system. So that's where uh, you would use the earnings code. You can do the same thing for, with routine services. So uh, routine services, you might have an RN routine, you might have an LVN routine. Uh, and if you if you've got them set up, and you could have several different types of routine services, like a postmortem visit, if you classify as a routine service, and your payroll system, all they care about are routine services, then all of those service codes you could flag as a routine um, earnings code. And so it just helps you organize the payroll reporting for your agency. Then once you get all of this set up, you just hit your save option. Okay, so I added this one so you can see it on the screen. Now, one of the things there's an, another step at this point that you need to put uh, in the system once you add these is you want to make sure that your organization pay rate exists. Um, and it's really a standard rate. It's not necessarily what you pay all of your associates because you may pay them different rates for the same service. So you're going to need to go to your settings menu and your organization region agency option. And you're going to get a, a screen that has a directory tree that sits at the left. It's a three tier directory. The top one's your organization. The middle ones are written as the region, and the last one is the agency. So where the pay rates are set up is under the organization. So you'll be selecting the first one in the three-tier directory. And then once this opens, just go to your pay rates, and you're going to be adding pay rates here. Now, I'm going to show you two different uh, types of pay rates to add. And so I'm going to select this one since we just did pay only. So I'm going to show you where to add that pay only. Here's the IDT re review. So hourly, um, let's say that's it weekly. Let's say you pay $45 for this. If you do IDT on the weekend, which I don't can't think of an agency that does, and you would pay a different rate, but you could put in a higher rate. If you did IDT review on the weekend and it's $45 week in a weekend, it doesn't matter. You can leave it blank. You do have the ability to override the pay rate. This override sits in the scheduling when you want to assign an associate to it. It also sits, sits in the verification. Most locations don't use this override and they actually have uh, the rate information removed from the scheduling screen for their associates. So, um, but you could override the rate if you wanted to. Most locations don't do that. And I will come back on a, a, a different service and show you how the weighted visit calculation works. And then just put in your start date and hit your setting. Okay, I'm going to take you into the, uh, the nursing one. Now, when you go through this training with our accounts receivable support team, um, uh, when, you, when you're doing uh, this with your accounts receivable support team, I have a question, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, you're, uh, once I get service cards set up for your agency, you're gonna need to add the standard pay rates uh, for those service codes that you'd be using for your agency. So uh, you, uh, you, not just the pay only as you do this for, you're gonna be doing that uh, for the services as well. But th when they show you the, sc the screens, just know that you'll be adding your organization usual and customary charge rates, and you'll be adding pay rates. So for pay only, you only need to add the pay rates. So with that in mind, I did want to show you how 
uh, this way to visit calculation work. So I pulled up an assessment visit. Let's say you give them $150 for this assessment visit. And on the weekends, you give them 165. You can override it if you want, but like I said, most, most locations don't. Okay, this is where the way to visit calculation comes into play. On average, how long does it take somebody to do this visit on average? So if it, on average, it takes them two and a quarter hours, you would type in 2.25 and then put in your start date. Then, uh, let's say here's an our inpatient discharge assessment visit, so you're completing additional information for the assessment visit. So uh, let's say that you, you're going to pay them 140 for this, and on weekends you'll pay them 150. On average, this may take them an hour and a half to do uh, the assessment visit. Now, whoops, yeah, I got that right. Okay, now there's one sitting down here for an RN supervisory visit. This is a standalone supervisory visit. It's not done in conjunction with a skilled service. So this means that the RN did this separately, and let's say that you will give the RN $50 for this, and you're not gonna give her anything because you don't want supervisory visits done on the weekend. And on average, this may take them half an hour. Whoops. Okay, then your RN routine visit if you're doing a visit, it could be a one-to-one -one match. You don't need to put anything here. You could just put in whatever the uh, rate is. And I'll just put it in the date. Okay, so if it's a one-to-one -one match, you're fine. If it's not a one-to-one -one match, you want to put in what that way to visit calculation would be. So that, that shows you how this functions. There are two sections and the system that is the way to visit calculations. In a dashboard, you're gonna have a chart that's looking at full-time caregivers. And if you had somebody that did all routine visits and they did 20 of them, uh, and you had somebody that did all assessment visits and they only did 10 of them, you would want them to show 20 plus different visits in that dashboard chart. So that's why you're using the weighted visit calculation. Also, there is another report for full-time uh, associate uh, productivity that uses uh, with the weighted visit calculations for future services. So you can have services scheduled so you can see that going forward. And once you verify the service, it will use the actual time. So in that case, you're using it uh, to project the way the, the uh, number of services or uh, productivity they're doing, as well as you can actually see the, the time for those individuals. So that's what that does. Now let me go ahead and save this and then let me get back to your question. Participants in that service all have a different hourly rate. When we go through the um, uh, associate master file, I will show you how to add all the information for each individual associate. This one that's in your organization is a uh, master file is typically what you'd quote. So if somebody called you up and said, I'm an, I'm an RN, what, if, uh, what do you pay for RN services? And you say yeah, our, our normal rate is 150. And then they want to know if that's negotiable. And you could say yes, depending on um, education and experience and, and so on. So it could be negotiable. So this would be your standard rate. When we go through the associate master file, which I do believe we're doing tomorrow, I will show you the, the tab where you can add uh, individual rates for each associate. So one, you could pay 130, 
Uh, another one you could pay 140 for the same service. Another one you might pay 165 for the same service. So you'll see that there. Okay. So um, do I have any questions about what you've seen so far today? So you will be happy to know this concludes today's training. So tomorrow we're going to go through the associate master file and show you how to add one. And then uh, I'll show you how to assign associate work baskets items. If I don't have any other questions, you guys have a great rest of the day. And I, I'll talk uh, to you tomorrow. Great. Yeah, we have we have a quick question. Okay. So this is this is just these seven uh, trainings that you're doing are really just a general kind of a high level overview, correct? We'll be getting um, more assistance on setting up these tables or is this sort of the expectation that we run with the tables now? Well, it, it, it's sort of 50-50. It, 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 you, can, you can work with the tables and see how they function and look at the information. And of course, if you have any questions, we can assist you with it, so that that's not a problem. We're not, we're just not going to train it, train you on this and drop it in your lap. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's why I say it's a little harder to do the associate master uh, or to do all of the administrative trainings uh, because I'm not using live data. But when you get into some of the other trainings, like the clinical training and accounts receivable, they will be working in your data file. This one's a little more right. difficult. That's right. why I that's why I get to train it. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that'll help to see our own our own data, definitely. Thank you. Oh, yes. And so you if you are able to sign in to Carefficient now, you should already see pretty much the majority of your tables set up except for those four. I mentioned to you that you definitely would need to update for sure. Other ones, if you think you need to change them as you go along, you can do that. And they're relatively simple to change. I mean, there, there's no delay in it. If you add it, if you add it, the minute you hit the add button, it's in the tape. It's in the drop down list or on the screen. Or, so they're relatively easy to do. It's not like you have to wait a week to get it into the table. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Well, again, you guys have a great rest of the day, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Did you want to? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.